physical um, uh, virus and also the biplanar uh, osteotomy that has been described in order to correct the deformity of the internal rotation and the virus at the same time just making a biplanar uh, biplanar osteotomy in two planes. So just to go through some learning points, uh, what I learned so far is that infantile Brown's disease is a very difficult pathology to treat no matter what age. The bracing doesn't work well after two, three years old, especially in obese patients and patients with the, uh, are affected on both legs. Uh, the, to choose the right treatment is really rely on patient's age and virus degree with or without bony bars. The recurrency rate is very important no matter which technique is used. And uh, always remember to associate lateral proximal tibial MEP physiodesis to proximal tibial osteotomy with bony bars. Uh, and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. And uh, I think what we're going to do is we'll carry on with all the talks, and then we'll do a question and answer session at the end. So next, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ahmed uh, El Hawani from Egypt, and he's going to talk to us on the correction of severe adolescent cases in limited resources areas with minimally invasive osteotomy and simple Elizara fixator. So thank you, Dr. El Hawani. Thank you. So can you see the screen? Yes. yes, and we can hear you. You can start. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm uh, Ahmed Halawani. I'm. Uh, a clinical lecturer in Cairo University. Uh, currently, I'm working in James Budget Hospital in uh, in the UK. Um, uh, I will present today our uh, our study about correction of the severe adolescent blind disease uh, cases in the uh, in the area with the limited resources uh, when you use a, a minimally invasive osteotomy and a simple uh, circular errors of errors of is uh, of uh, frame. Uh, uh, first of all, ad uh, adolescent uh, blind disease or late onset tibia vara is a progressive and uh, pathological genovarum uh, center on the tibia in a shadow more than uh, 11 years old. It, it has been thoroughly studied uh, with the multiple published reviews and reports, but the, still the optimum methods of correction and stabilization remains, uh, remains controversial. Uh, and and our study, our aim was was to evaluate the radiological uh, and clinical outcome of the acute single stage correction of the severe uh, late onset tibia vara by percutaneous osteotomy uh, for the tibia and the circular external fixator with a simple two rings, as we can see in the picture on the left hand side. Um, uh, the study was conducted between the 2000, 2016 and the 2020 in the Cairo University Hospital. Uh, our uh, inclusion criteria was a severe deformity, so the femoral tibial shaft angle more than 20 degrees, and our mean age was a 16.6 years uh, with a range of 13 to 22 years old. Uh, uh, our exclusion criteria was where uh, depression of the medial tibial plateau and the age uh, less than 13 years old and abnormality in the lateral distal femoral angle. We retrospectively reviewed 30 patients, 32 TB, and all the cases uh, continue uh, follow up for uh, two years minimally. Uh, our surgical technique was uh, uh, first of all is to assess and plan the deformity. So the deformity were measured and assessed clinically and radiologically, and the frame consists of the two symmetric rings uh, is uh, connected with a four uh, threaded uh, rods was assembled, and the bare continuous straight osteotomy were done, uh, and then uh, we we correct the three component of the deformity, uh, the various internal with torsion and broker vatum, uh, and uh, and make sure we achieve the acquired translation uh, clinically uh, under uh, the II images. And we we held our uh, temporary correction with a, a K-wire and then bought the two rings and held the two rings with uh, four to six, six, uh, uh, six millimeter shans or wires. Uh, 
our results showed uh, um, statistically improve uh, when comparing the preoperative and postoperative outcome uh, clinically and radiologically. So we assess the medial axis deviation and the femorotibial shaft angle and the medial proximal tibial angle and posterior proximal tibial angle and also the knee score, um, the HSS. Uh, our complication, uh, we had the over collection, uh, over correction in the three cases. Then our main complication is the pin track infection uh, with a 35% uh, rate uh, developing one or more episodes of the superficial pin side infection with ma mainly reported around the proximal uh, shans screws or wires. Uh, all the cases improved with a local pain side care and oral antib antibiotic, except uh, two patients with needed to the deep uh, removal of the or change the site of the uh, of the bends and the depriving and wash out we had uh, two cases of the delayed union and uh, the mean duration of the elezer was uh, 12 months with a range uh, uh, for if it's a union in 10 to 18 years uh, 18 weeks uh, and uh, the mean follow-up was 33 months all at, at the final follow-up all the patient had the full knee range of motion and normal uh, function all the cases uh, progressive to union and there is no any cases with the recurrence deformity the, this is a uh, a, a preoperative a clinical photo and radiograph for 15 years old with had a, a correction with the Eliezer of, uh, with a and Berkitin's osteotomy. Uh, and we can see the postoperative correction in the images on the right hand side. Uh, again, this is uh, the same uh, boss operative at three months and after removal of the frame at the 3.5 uh, uh, months. Uh, and we can see the correction uh, clinically and radiologically. Uh, our finding uh, when we use this uh, technique, especially in the limited resources, uh, it is many, many invasive. It's, it's a symbol and, and the frame is less bulky. And at the same time, it's a cheap multi planner correction and secure fixation. Um, and it's adjustable. Uh, and and relatively low complication rate um, uh, and allow early with bear and return to function uh, affordable in the context of the limited resources our study limitation we acknowledge that we, we it's a retrospective study short term follow up uh, and and a small sample size our conclusion, our, our learning, um, uh, as for any blunt disease patient, is uh, uh, we have to tailor the treatment uh, uh, based on the individual uh, individual cases and assess our patient uh, functionally and uh, and radiologically before uh, selecting the most appropriate procedure for him. But our result suggests that the acute correction uh, and the same circular frame is a good treatment choice. Uh, in a case of the uh, uh, late onset uh, tibia virus, especially in the severe deformity. And this is a paper published. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much for that talk, uh, uh, Dr. El Halwani. Uh, I'm next going to introduce uh, Professor Gamal Hosni, who yeah. actually does not need an introduction, uh, as you all will know him. And uh, he is the previous president of uh, Egyptian Orthopedic Association and World Assami BR, uh, as well as he is the head of orthopedic surgery at Benna University Hospital. And it gives me great pleasure to ask him to give the talk on treatment of late onset recurrent and neglected cases with Elizarov or hexapods. Thank you. Thank you, James, for the introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Rigi for including me. Thanks, Rigi, and thank also Sanjeev. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to neglected cases. So I don't know what you mean by uh, uh, Lyme disease. Do you mean such a case or this case, that case, or that case? What do you mean by uh, blunt disease? Um, do you mean ligamentous laxity, intraarticular deformity, extraarticular deformity, 
secondary femoral deformities, physial asymmetrical growth, shortening, overcorrection, or all of them together. Again, are you going to think about uh, one thing? It's a heterogeneous samples. Are we talking about one thing or many things? So do you have intra-articular deformity, extra-articular deformity, or both? The forms usually ignored. The instability or ligamentous lack of the forms. Yes, vulgar. So when we discuss, perhaps we are not discussing the same issue, or we are talking about different patients. Uh, if you think about osteotomy, we think about the site of osteotomy is going to be articular, articular both the top of osteotomy, semicircular extraction or innovation, intra and extra articular. Are we going to treat the patient unimodal? One thing like this late onset, just an osteotomy, and this is eight years full up. Correction of the axis. This is unimodal or multimodal because you have other things to treat. You have a femoral deformity, you have a tibial deformity, you have a laxity of the ligaments. So you can use uh, unimodal or multimodal treatment. And this is an example of recurrent cases with a fat person, just overweight. Look to the articular surface. You have articular deformity. You have extra articular. You can do medial plateau ele elevation, like this one, with multiple holes. And this is the way I do it with multiple osteotomes. The media to fix the and you put a graft between the fibula. Jamal, Jamal, we're having some audio issues. Can we do another the top part? The to the Gamal, can you uh, shut your video? Then maybe we can uh, hear your audio better. Sorry. The laxity of the Is it okay now? Yes, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Finally, we think about the rotational deformity. We don't treat the, the original, originally we don't treat the rotational deformity. This is the last step. It's very elusive when you, when you treat the rotational deformity at the beginning. We always wait at the correction of all the deformities and we correct the rotational deformity gradually. You can appreciate it. The patient can also appreciate it. And this is the way we correct the rotational deformity. We change the frame and we do. Gamal, can you hear us? If it's a disease or something. Relapsed cases like this case, which had been treated by plating and osteotomies. 
and the adverse procurvatum internal rotation, shortening and ligamentous laxity. And you see, you can correct all of them. We couldn't remove this implant. We removed the upper one and from the osteotomy, we do lengthening and correction of the deformity all together at the same time. And you see the picture. You can correct everything together. I don't have many publications, but I started to publish the ideas about it because I'm concerned about ligamentous laxity because of most of the neglected cases and the recurrent cases, they have ligamentous laxity. And I see that the literature, there is lack or scarce literature talking about ligamentous laxity. And you can do differential lengthening. You can lengthen the tibia and leave the fibula alone. You can remove part of the fibula and do compression here to distalization of the proximal femoral and the lateral ligament. You can elevate the medial plateau. You can read this paper published just a few months ago. Also, you can have premature osteoarthritis and ligamentous laxity, like this patient with plating. You remove the plates, you correct the deformity, you remove a segment of the fibula, and you correct all of them together with direct wood bearing, you know, just the patient had to move immediately and you had to lengthening at the same time. And this is compression of the fibula. In conclusion, um, when we talk, what do you mean by blind disease? Do you mean asymmetrical physial growth, intraarticular deformity, extraarticular deformity, shortening, secondary femoral osteotomies, ligamentous laxity, early osteoarthritis? You have to define your patients. Most, I think, the lecturer ignored this topic, ligamentous laxity. We use three methods to correct the ligamentous laxity medial plateau elevation, differential lengthening, we lengthen the tibia and leave the fibula alone, shortening of the fibula and the gradual descent of the proximal fibula. Like this patient with ligamentous laxity, we sick part of the fibula, then gradual compression, and this is gaining conclusion, distraction histogenesis. I don't talk about the frame. You can use any frame, you can use TSF, you can use a simple frame. You can use a complex frame, you can use a hexapod or something. I don't talk about the frames. I talk about the principles only. Distraction histogenesis or gradual correction using circular fixators is the most appropriate treatment for severe problems in blind disease. And these are the references. Thank you. you. Can, Thank you your much. patient can move immediately. Thank you. All right, great. Okay, uh, moving right along. So I know there's been a lot of talk on plateau elevation. So I invite uh, Dr. Peter uh, Murray from South Africa, and he's going to talk about the predictive factors for recurrence in infantile blounds and indications for medial plateau elevation. So Peter, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjeev, and thank you also for the opportunity to share our experience. Um, we see a large number of children uh, with um, infantile Blount's disease in South Africa. And one of the common problems that we have is recurrence after corrective tibial osteotomy. Uh, this then motivated us to investigate uh, what exactly our recurrence rate was and also to see if there were some factors that would help us to predict that recurrence. <sighs> So if we, look, if we look at the literature, we know that the recurrence rate is high, but there's quite a wide range from about 30% to about 70%, depending on how uh, we select uh, the groups of patients, as, as Dr. Hosnes has, has uh, elucidated now as well. Um, the, and this is not a, a recurrence in Blount's disease um, is, not, is not only a problem because of the compound risk of complications for, from doing multiple uh, corrective osteotomies, but also because of the cost to the family as well as to the healthcare service. And we also know that in the long run, uh, there are, uh, the, the outcome is worse when these children have uh, recurrence and they require repeat osteotomies. These long-term studies have shown that um, uh, children with recurrent uh, uh, deformity and repeat osteotomies are more likely to have painful symptomatic knees at uh, skeletal maturity. Uh, 
So several factors have been uh, determined to be associated with recurrence, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some that I'd like to emphasize. Firstly, the modifiable factors, age at osteotomy, which, which has already been, been, been discussed, obesity has also been shown to be associated. Knee instability is a significant issue, um, and we wanted to investigate that as well. A radiological stages, the lung and skull stage, which everyone is familiar with, the more recent Lamont stage, and then the objective um, measurable uh, factors of the medial physial slope and the tibiofemoral angle. So the age of tibial osteotomy, while there is a range in the literature, um, I think most, most authors now agree that we need to affect correction before the child's fourth birthday. Uh, knee instability was first described by Blount in 1937, but it was suffered in cuts at uh, open arthrotomy that defined the character of the posterior medial depression, found that in several of these cases, the anterior tibia is relatively unaffected, uh, with the knee then stabilizing in full extension, but remaining unstable in 15 degrees of flexion. Um, we, that's unfortunately not the whole story about instability. Um, we use this pragmatic classification of knee instability, uh, using a grade, grade one, uh, is the classic suffered cuts instability. Um, if it progresses with a more lateral attenuation um, or perhaps intraarticular distortion, this knee becomes unstable and full extension as well. And then the last stage is uh, after several years of walking on a distorted knee, uh, these children have, um, uh, advanced the uh, distortion of the proximal tibia and they have an observable lateral thrust during the stance phase and um, this is also measurable as lateral subluxation on the standing AP x-ray as you can see in the image on the right. So the Langer School classification can predict recurrence uh, however, um, it's not completely certain which stage three or stage four that predicts recurrence. And it's also these intermediate stages where the inter-observer reliability has been um, brought into doubt. So we are really enthusiastic about the medial physical slope. Um, this is an angle that's drawn between a line parallel to the lateral physis and a second line drawn parallel to the medial metaphysial defect. Now, both in the original report by Kling in 1990 and also in a subsequent report, they were able to show that 100% of cases that had an NPS of greater than 60 degrees uh, were associated with recurrence. So let's have a look at what we found in 20, 20 kids uh, with 35 limbs, all treated before the seventh birthday with uh, curved proximal tibial osteotomy corrected to physiological valgus. We found a recurrence rate of 40%. We couldn't easily measure the medial physal slope in all cases. Um, it was a retrospective study. So when the um, metaphysical defect was oblique to the plane of the X-ray, either because of the orientation of the defect or some error in the, the way the X-ray was taken, we constructed an oval with the metaphysical line being the, um, the bisector of this oval along the long axis um, and subtended the angle that way. Um, when there was lateral physial widening, this obviously represented a more severe uh, form of the disorder. And we then, um, and David, we then measured the, the physial line along the metaphysis so that the greater angle will reflect the greater distortion in the morphology of the proximal tibia. So in simple association testing, the um, our instability classification was associated with recurrence and similarly the radiological lung and skull stage and the measurable TFA and medial physial slope. In terms of looking at the extent of this association, binomial logistic regression analysis uh, confirmed the, these associations, notably a TFA greater than 30 degrees at an odds ratio of 4.9, but the most significant one remained the medial physial slope uh, greater than 60 degrees. Multivariate logistic regression analysis confirmed uh, the NPS to be the only factor, um, and rock analysis showed that the optimal cut point is indeed 60 degrees. So that measure in isolation is a very specific 95% and quite sensitive in order to predict recurrence. So wh why do we want to re determine recurrence risks? Obviously, we want to try and avoid it. Um, the two things in terms of primary prevention we can look at is correction before the child's fourth birthday, and then theoretically weight reduction. Unfortunately, I haven't come across anyone who's been able to effectively uh, reduce weight and um, alter outcome, um, and perhaps public health uh, initiatives in the future can help us with this and uh, decrease the overall incidence of plant disease. 
But the second group of patients now where we sit with children with uh, measured increased recurrence risk. Strategies to decrease recurrence in this subset of patients has also unfortunately been disappointing. Overcorrection um, hasn't been shown to definitively prevent um, repeat osteotomies. Certainly undercorrection is, should be avoided at all costs. Medial epiphysiolysis has also not routinely prevented uh, repeat osteotomies. Permanent lateral epiphysiodesis in young kids are not advised. We looked at whether temporary lateral uh, hemiepiphysiodesis in combination with tibial osteotomy may decrease the recurrence rate. And we've published on this. It was a small group of patients that was underpowered. There was a m marginal decrease in the percentage of recurrence, but this was not statistically significant. I would encourage you to have a look at this, this paper and perhaps consider its application in your uh, treatment selection um, algorithms. So in summary, predictors of recurrence, um, in our, our, uh, while there are several factors that are associated with recurrence, in our, our cohort, NPS greater than 60 degrees was the best single predictor in our, our patient cohort. Um, now, for the second part of my talk, it's very brief. I see this was a question from one of the audience members as well. Uh, when do we do medial plateau elevation? Now, these children present to us typically late, um, so after the age of four, uh, or after the recurrence, um, after previous uh, tibial osteotomy. They've got a variable medial plateau depression uh, with associated lateral ligament attenuation, generally a combination of the two. And then they may also have lateral tibial subluxation during the stance phase of the so-called lateral thrust. Um, and uh, I'll show you a video of that now. This, however, is something I just wanted to show you. Uh, should never just look at an x-ray. You can see the, the measurable, uh, the objective instability in this, in this child. And you can see how he changes his lower, lower limb alignment. And a static x-ray will not show you the complete picture here of what you have, what you have to deal with. And the second video here is just looking at that proximal tibia. Just look at that lateral thrust during the stance phase of gait. So that's, those are the clinical evaluations. Um, now, the radiological assessment of the medial depression, one has to be careful not to overestimate it because the, the medial proximal tibia is predominantly cartilaginous, especially in Blount's disease. Um, so we uh, always do an arthrogram. You can see the image on the right. The, that abbreviation stands for arthrogram angle of depression of the medial plateau. Um, and we do that before we do an elevation. So what are our indications for medial plateau elevation? A child with a knee instability of grade two or three. Uh, we try not to do this procedure before the age of seven years, but we will consider it in children between the ages of five to seven if they have had recurrence after a previous tibial osteotomy already. We always uh, quantify the orthogram angle of depression of the medial plateau to be at least 30 degrees. There's no, uh, I haven't come across any normal measurements here. And then we also uh, look at how much uh, correction we can achieve. And then uh, together, with some of the other speakers, I cannot overemphasize the importance of doing a concomitant lateral uh, tibial, proximal tibial epiphysiodesis in order to prevent a subsequent another recurrence when we do a medial plateau elevation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, very important uh, uh, sort of uh, topic of recurrence, and thanks for your messages. Uh, it gives me great pleasure next to invite Professor uh, Mark Eidelman, uh, who is the director and head of the pediatric orthopedic unit at Rambam in Israel. Uh, his main interest is in limb reconstruction and deformity correction. And he's going to talk to us about the surgical tips and tricks for medial plateau elevation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm pediatric orthopedic surgeon in Root Children's Hospital, which is part of Rambam Healthcare Campus in Haifa. This is Langen Schild uh, classification, and my topic concentrated on hemi plateau elevation. It reserved for patients with Langen Schild five and six, and usually leg length discrepancy is part of the game. In skeletally immature patient, closure of the epiphysis and preemptive lengthening is imperative. Fail to do it usually will lead to another intervention. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. And here's an example of my bad judgment. Look at this. Oops. This is five-year-old girl, failed of a guided growth on the left side, 
15 millimeter Lagrange discrepancy, and as you see, broken eight plate. Uh, sorry to stop you. Your slides are not moving, uh, Professor. Sorry. Could you see now? Now we can see the presentation. I think you need to go to uh, presentation mode and run it. Just a moment. Thank you. Hmm? Really cool. Just a moment. It's good now. Uh, good Mark. now, but yeah. uh, I'm not sure that you will see it's, uh, it's not in PowerPoint mode. So this is five-year-old girl, failure body growth on the left side, it's a small leg lens discrepancy and broken eight plate. So what's the treatment option? What you will do, reinsertion of guided growth, proximal tibial osteotomy, preemptive lensing using X-Fix or whatever, acute correction, hemiplateau elevation in this stage. So I choose the proximal tibial osteotomy uh, without uh, closure of the remaining epiphysis. And here is my uh, results. Uh, apparently, we have good correction, but uh, it's Langen scale six, uh, and uh, you see what happened after one year. So now you have to do a hemiplateau elevation. When bar is established and medial joint line is incongruent, plateau elevation restoration of joint line is impo important. Always close remaining growth, always close proximal epiphysis in patient younger than 11 years, and don't accept nothing than perfect when you're doing any plateau elevation. Always check both planes intraoperatively. So I don't know why. Uh, so here is the steps of uh, percutaneous uh, lateral hemiphysiodesis because medial is already closed. And uh, we start with medial incision, oblique osteotomy toward the intercondylar notch. Wire shows exact location of the osteotomy. Don't penetrate joint. If it happened, don't panic, it, uh, it will be okay. Electrical saw for osteotomy is okay, but completion of osteotomy is safer to perform by osteotome. So here is the steps, elevation of the medial plateau. I'm doing this toothless laminar spreader. I had cases with crushed medial plateau by, uh, by regular uh, laminar spreader. Elevate plateau to restoration of the joint at the same level with the lateral part, we insert two wires from lateral to medial uh, uh, side. My preferred option is tricortical iliac bone graft. And look at this. This is my graft. And here I prefer to augment, augment the tricortical iliac bone graft by, uh, by bony life, which is a uh, uh, bioactive uh, in glass. So uh, then you can choose. I, I always applied a uh, hexapod for residual correction and uh, preemptive lengthening. But in a, I, did, I did many times simultaneously medial plateau elevation, and after one week started the correction. In the recent years, I prefer to wait for three weeks then come back after three weeks to operating room, do small percutaneous uh, proximal tibial osteotomy, and do a uh, rest of the uh, correction. It's your option. I think that the, this way is much uh, safer. So uh, here is the end results. The picture on the right is uh, five years later, close to skeletal maturity. And as you, you can see that, she has exactly the same uh, 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 lens, uh, not even one millimeter uh, uh, difference between between two sides. So, uh, and uh, 
the correction because we close the remaining epiphysis, the correction uh, doesn't rec- the, the doesn't uh, the the deformity doesn't come back. So tibia vara uh, usually adolescent tibia vara treated by standard technique, which included proximal tibia and fibula plus fibular osteotomy, and uh, fibular fixation. Uh, I prefer my preferred option to do it to do it uh, 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 between the middle and distal third of the of the uh, of the of the shaft so so uh, I learned it oh we should you always do fibular osteotomy what happened so the uh, uh, I learned from Charles Taylor that uh, if no additional fibrillar length is needed, most tibial deformity can be corrected without fixing or osteotomizing the fibula. Only in patients with significant rotation procurvatum, when procurvatum is greater than virus, fibula should be osteotomized. So we, uh, in order to do it, uh, Taylor uh, suggested that the, sorry, that the origin should be placed at the level of proximal T5 joint. I published two papers in journal Children's Orthopedics in 2008 and 2015 uh, in journal Pediatric Orthopedics. In the last uh, paper, we had 21 patients with 25 tibia, mean, mean age over adolescent tibia vara, mean age was around 15. So in group A, there were patients that uh, underwent uh, fibular osteotomy and fibular fixation. In the group B, there was no fibular osteotomy and no fixation fibula to the tibia. Uh, we measured the proximal and distal tip fib distance. Uh, there was no ankle malalignment in both groups. Uh, and we had delayed union in two patients, one in each group. In general, there was no significant difference in standard measure, measurements between two uh, groups. Uh, and of course, we put the origin at the level of proximal tip fib joint. So some examples before, after, this is clinical uh, appearance after two years. I did it in many a uh, so-called classical obese uh, uh, blonde patient uh, and had uniform and good results without uh, any uh, osteotomy of the fibula. In conclusion, correction of adolescent tibia var in most patients might be performed safely without fibular osteotomy and fixation of the fibula. And my learning per- my points, it's Closure of the lateral part of the epiphysis and preemptive lensing is crucial for prevention of recurrence in Langen scale 5 6. And hemi plateau elevation is important for joint restoration. Fibular osteotomy should be reserved for patients with significant rotation and proper widening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Eidelman, uh, for your experience uh, in the, these cases. I'm now going to invite uh, Sanjeev Sabawal, who possibly has got the mas- most maximum publications on Blount's disease. He's a director of limb lengthening and complex reconstruction at uh, UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. He's got a great track record and been uh, the previous president of LLRS. Uh, Sanjeev, please, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, let me just get this going. And I know we're running a little bit behind, uh, but uh, I hope uh, the organizers will allow us a few extra minutes just so we can uh, wrap this up and then answer the audience questions and have a little discussion. So I'll um, quickly go over some of the lessons that I've learned in my short career in pediatric orthopedics. Um, So, and some of this is going to be just a wrap up of things you've already heard earlier today. So as you know, Blount's disease comes in really two broad uh, types, uh, which may or may not be Mm 
I think you may be frozen. The torsion. And I think um, the pendulum is swinging a little bit towards guided growth, especially for the younger children yeah, in early onset blounts. And that's been uh, heard earlier today. I'm just going to show you an example of a somewhat atypical non-obese child with unilateral uh, blounts uh, who's just under four years uh, with, you know, simple guided growth and orthogram, like you've heard earlier, uh, with intentional overcorrection um, and then removal of hardware with, uh, you know, some uh, deviation back towards uh, the medial side. And of course, this child will need further follow-up and probably need another uh, bout of uh, guided growth before skeletal maturity. Um, but the guided growth can also be used, let's say, for the distal femur if you're planning to do a proximal tibial osteotomy with gradual correction in late onset, uh, late onset plans. Uh, and this is uh, one such example. So again, to recap, you know, guided growth is generally uh, preferred for mild to moderate deformities, depending on whichever measurement parameters you use. You obviously need to have some growth remaining. And it seems to be more effective in uh, patients who are not too obese. So I think the lesson here is appropriately timed guided growth can avoid the need for osteotomy in both early and late onset patients. Um, the second thing is based on um, a review we did. And I think it's pretty common knowledge that young children do have physiologic virus, mostly coming from the femur. Um, so I've occasionally come across cases done elsewhere where they've done either guided growth or femoral osteotomies in early onset patients. And I don't think that's really necessary because that's part of their physiologic virus. So I think the lesson here is that femoral virus is, all, is often normal in these young children less than four years old with early onset blounts, and those don't need to be addressed surgically. Um, then this is based on another uh, piece of work that we did where um, it's well known that obesity can cause precocious puberty. So how that translates in our world is that they have advanced skeletal age. So this can be an issue if you're trying to overcorrect someone with early onset blounts who presents late, but then they stop growing and then they're stuck in valgus. So that's not a good thing either. So just uh, be cognizant that some of these obese children uh, may have uh, advanced bone age and may stop growing at an earlier age than their peers. So again, watch out for advanced bone age in both early and late onset uh, blounts. It's more uh, significant in the earlier onset uh, children. Um, so we've heard a lot about uh, plateau elevation and depressed plateaus. Uh, but again, just to warn you that not every child, especially the younger ones, will have truly depressed plateaus. And some of that is related to unossified medial proximal tibial chondroepiphysis with a thickened medial meniscus uh, so that the joint line may not be as off as uh, you know appears on plain x-rays. And that was very nicely illustrated by uh, Peter earlier today. So I think the lesson here is that young children with early onset blounts often have this unossified medial proximal tibial chondroepiphysis and do not typically require a plateau elevation unless you've evaluated that with an advanced imaging such as an arthrogram and or an MRI. Um, so here's a child, four-year-old, that I'd done an osteotomy way back and then um, had a recurrence. And in those days, we were using staples. So we used a staple for guided growth. It didn't improve. It actually got worse. The deformity did. And so um, here she was a year later, and x-rays show a uh, bony bar. So obviously, guided growth is not going to work in these advanced uh, stages of early onset blounts. So this is a good indication, I feel, for uh, medial plateau elevation. And like you've heard from almost every speaker, needs to be combined with a lateral uh, proximal tibial epiphysiodesis and often a proximal fibular epiphysiodesis at the same time. Um, 
So I think the lesson here is that older children with advanced stages of early onset blunts may require a plateau elevation. Um, and again, with completion of the epiphysiodesis across the proximal tibia and fibula. Um, here's a lesson I learned about uh, follow-up and need for follow-up. This was a seven-year-old older patient that I still tried to do a guided growth on the left and a tibial osteotomy on the right, quickly had a recurrence on the right, missed a few appointments. And you can see how the right side got worse, the left actually overcorrected. And then by the time he presented, um, he had this windswept deformity. And so on the right side, we tried to um, do a plateau elevation, which was you know partially successful, didn't quite reestablish the mechanical axis deviation. But see what's happening on the left side. It went from varus to valgus. And now with the hardware removed, it's drifting back into varus. And uh, we sort of broke one of our rules for knee joint obliquity and reestablished his mechanical axis on the right by doing a temporary guided growth on the right side to reestablish his mechanical axis. But on the left, you can see that he's drifted more into varus. And by now, he's gone from a reversible to an irreversible problem uh, with more of a physeal bar that was uh, uh, confirmed uh, with advanced imaging. And a guided growth obviously didn't help. So then he needed a plateau elevation on the left side as well. And again, there are many techniques of doing this. And so here he is at skeletal maturity with reestablished uh, leg lens and near normal uh, mechanical axis deviation. So I think the very important lesson here is that children with blounts do need close follow-up till skeletal maturity. And that's even more important when you're doing guided growth for these patients with uh, many years of growth remaining. And, you know, this question just came up earlier today. Do these patients lose weight after realigning their limbs? And the short answer is absolutely not. So we uh, followed, uh, I think, 40-some patients who had near normal reestablishment of mechanical axis, um, and none of them, absolutely none of them, lost weight other than the one patient who had bariatric surgery. So I think reestablishing um, joint line and mechanical axis is very important, but you should also let the family know that just straight, straightening the legs isn't going to make them lose weight. Uh, and then this here's a final patient. It's an adult who was ready for uh, knee arthroplasty, but the arthroplasty surgeons couldn't do anything because of the extreme uh, residual medial translation of the distal fragment, despite a near tricompartmental arthritis. So really, my goal was just to reestablish um, and translate back the distal fragment. And I think the picture on your left just shows how much of that itrogenic translation needs to be corrected. So if that had been addressed uh, with that previous surgeries, I think that would have made life easier. But thankfully, um, we were able to reestablish the uh, mechanical axis on the right and left um, with slight overcorrection at the Fujisawa point. And here she was 10 years later, still functioning well without uh, needing an arthroplasty at this time. So I think uh, the lesson here is that you need to not just think of the angular correction, but also typically laterally translating the distal fragment since the apex or the cora is more proximally at the proximal tibial growth plate. So I think some unresolved issues are why do some patients have unilateral pathology if obesity or a genetic cause was really the prime etiology? So I think that still needs to be sorted out. And like was shown nicely again uh, by Peter in the earlier talk, uh, you know, we look at static deformities based on x-rays, but how about the dynamic alignment? Is that the same or different? And clearly, it is not the same, especially in some of these young children with advanced Blount's disease and various stress. And the other issue that I think is worth uh, thinking about is, do you really need to reestablish the mechanical axis so that it's going through the center of the knee or children who are obese with large thighs 
tolerate and walk better with slight undercorrection. And I think that's something that's not been totally sorted out, at least not in my mind. And then how much knee joint obliquity is acceptable? And I think the typical number is five degrees, and maybe it's a little more tolerable if the uh, femur is in varus and the tibia is in valgus, et cetera. Uh, some of that is based on biomechanics and conjecture. So I think that's something that's worth looking at it prospectively. And finally, some of these older children who are obese, what are the indications for uh, venous thromboembolic prophylaxis? And I think that needs to be standardized as well. So just to wrap up uh, for our entire webinar, um, so I'm switching hats now to a moderator. I think what we've heard today is the goals of treatment for blounds is pretty straightforward. You want to correct the skeletal deformities where they are happening, reestablish uh, joint orientation angles around the knee as close to normal values as possible with the goal of equalizing uh, leg lengths by skeletal maturity and preserving function and minimizing morbidity. And then, so these are the sort of final take-homes that I could summarize from our uh, talks today, uh, that you want to have a comprehensive pre-op analysis, not just based on radiographs, but on clinical exam. And I think in the last decade or so, guided growth has become a very viable option compared to bracing or osteotomies as sort of the happy medium with low morbidity in young children with early onset blounds. Uh, try to assess and address all deformities as much as feasible. And like we've heard from come of our, some of our talks today, you know, the treatment for blounds, like in any pediatric deformity, needs to be principle-based and available implants are sort of dealer's choice and what uh, your environment allows. Uh, recurrent deformity is very common, especially in early onset uh, blounds and needs to be, these children need to be followed till skeletal maturity at a regular basis, especially if you've done guided growth in a child with early onset blounds. Uh, avoid iatrogenic deformities. Uh, if you're doing an acute correction or even a gradual correction with osteotomies, then uh, please be sure to do some translation that's appropriate in both the frontal and the sagittal plane. And once again, you need close follow-up till skeletal maturity. Um, thank you so much for a great webinar. And I think we're going to open this uh, for some discussion. And maybe, James, uh, you can tell us what the questions from the audience are in the chat, and we could start with those. I think the first question was uh, indications for hemiplatter elevation surgery. Should it depend on age? Uh, patient's age status of the proximal tibial growth plate or blount disease. Does uh, Marco, I think he's replied, but do you want to say something about it? Uh, okay, we'll open it to the panel. Um, and I'm sorry, yeah. I listened to half the question. Can, um, does somebody in the panel want to talk about it? Okay. Go ahead, Peter. So I, I think I mentioned it br briefly in my talk. I think it uh, relates to, to several factors, specifically the, the age of the child. I think six or seven is, is probably appropriate. Um, certainly we want a child where uh, further medial growth is, is unlikely. So lung and scope five or six uh, would be uh, would be an acceptable um, measurement. And then uh, we definitely want to have a, a knee that's objectively and measurably unstable from a true medial depression. And that can be determined either by intraoperative arthrogram or alternatively by an MRI. And I think uh, we need to we need to establish what the normal values of, of, of these things are so that we can more easily assess it uh, in, in our preoperative planning and uh, execution of correction. Right. And, and I think it's well known that, you know, we talk so much about Langenskold stages, but other than the extremes, for the especially the three fours and even fives, there's a lot of measurement variability. So, Peter, like your work and that uh, from the Texas Scottish Rite Group, the Lamont classification. So, I think people are now moving towards some other plain radiographic sort of indicators that can correlate with how the actual uh, plateau, medial plateau, appears. Would that be fair? 
Okay, uh, James. Uh, yeah. Any other question? There's one one question of uh, Do you make lower limbs radiograph standing on line or line position in those less than three years to assess deformity? Anyone in the panel, maybe? We are routinely doing a long X-rays after age two and a half years, just to see uh, if there is also femoral deformities. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think uh, it's you know the when the child can stand, even if they can stand with some with holding on to something, that's I think a better X-ray than um, than not um, than not standing. Now, having said that, if if it's a young child, and we've heard about indicators like the medial slope that Peter was talking about, then you can also get individual x-rays of the femur and tibia and, you know, measure angles that way. But I, I think if all things are equal, if the child can stand, then I think that's preferable. Uh, and a full length standing x-ray. Yeah. Thank you. There is one more here. How do you calculate it, pre calculate predicted remaining length of the tibia or femur in children who are for surgical Epiphysiodesis. Uh, um, well, so maybe I'll try to take that. So, yeah. um, as we said, you know, uh, some children with blounts have advanced bone age, so they may stop growing earlier. So I'm not sure if that's part of the question, but if the question is, what is their estimated leg length at skeletal maturity? Um, well, you could look at the other side if the other side is not affected. You can, of course, look at their height. Um, and as you've seen in many of the pictures, including mine, that sometimes we go for establishing a leg length equalization, even if you have to sacrifice some knee joint um, asymmetry. And I know Reggie Hamdi has done some work on looking at knee height asymmetry. So I think without having too much hard data a little bit of knee height asymmetry is okay and about you know maybe three to four centimeters is okay and maybe that's something the the panel can uh can also um you know discuss how much knee height asymmetry do you think is tolerable and um you know uh, as opposed to trying to do an osteotomy let's say in the femur when the problem is in the tibia for leg length purposes it's a little off topic but uh, do people have a have a gauge in terms of how, do you always go for the knee heights to be exactly the same or is it okay to be a little bit off i personally uh, do not mind it being off uh, depends on when they're present actually i suppose because sometimes you have to decide on that I think when you look at and speak to rehab uh, uh, consultants, they when they have patients with prosthesis at a different level, I think their thinking is up to five centimeters. I sometimes don't mind up to five. Uh, it's a simpler procedure. So uh, we, we usually discuss it with the family. Mm -hmm. well, some families, they don't accept it or something. We accept it up to three centimeters, no problem at all. Uh, the family is the insist sometimes. Yeah, interesting. I think that we should we should uh, lengthen it. What should be lengthening? If you have tibia and still have deformity, uh, for me it's not okay lengthening the femur for the lens discrepancy. But if there is no uh, tibial deformity, who cares? Uh, what what is your three, four, five centimeter uh, difference between? Uh, between knees, uh, I'm very uh, loyal for this. Uh, especially now, if you have leg length discrepancy with precise, I always doing femoral femoral lengthening if he, if he, there is no tibial deformity. Yeah. And uh, Reggie, you want to have the last word on this? You've done some work. We don't know yet. I um, mean, you mentioned how much uh, we don't know the long term effect. There are some functional um, uh, complications, definitely. We have patients, I think everyone has patients like this. When it was presented at the Basna, some people 
like including uh, the war and other people who are astonished, amazed that even this issue was brought up. But we don't have an answer. So I think it's something that has to be looked at at several centers because uh, uh, it needs a large number. But I don't think now we can say, is it two, is it three, is it four? As you mentioned, the answer, the last word is still not uh, in. All right. All right. Uh, there's one more question that just came up in the audience. Uh, what is the role of distal femoral osteotomy in blounds? Um, anybody want to take that? And maybe we should talk about an early onset blount and late onset blount separately. So let's just say, is there a role for a distal femoral osteotomy in a three-year-old who's got an LDFA, lateral distal femoral angle of 98 degrees? I've shown cases with distal osteotomy, but they were all recurrent cases. And they were all above the age 10. Yes. Okay. So I think that's yeah. like this. Exactly. So I think, and I, I think I mentioned this in passing, that younger children with blounts will have contralateral physiologic varus sometimes. So I, I think, and I think most panel uh, would, in, uh, would concur that it's less common to do a distal femoral osteotomy in early onset blounts. I honestly cannot remember a single patient that I've done that on. For late onset blounts, you know, the classic teaching is a third of the deformity, a third of the times is coming from the distal femur. So it's very important to sort of assess the joint orientation angles. If there is growth remaining, I feel guided growth, lateral distal femoral hemiepiphysiodesis is a good option. But if the child is done with growth or there's not enough growth remaining um, to compensate with guided growth, then I think that to me would be one indication to do a distal femoral osteotomy in an older patient with, lateral, uh, with late onset blounts who has no or limited growth remaining. Does the panel feel differently, anybody? I think I would agree with you, Sanjay. Yeah. yeah. What, what, yeah. What? I and I also completely agree with you that we shouldn't leave a deformity like, like this in blunt out of skeletal material. Okay. Uh, uh, I think that in whole my career I, I operated two or three uh, femoral deformities, blown disease, but we should be very uh, caution of is a uh, with uh, deformity correction on the femur. The good combination is uh, valgus tibia, varus uh, femur. If you correct the femur to, to, from uh, varus to valgus and you have valgus of the tibia, it's actually a bad combo. Yeah. So uh, I will very, very, very caution with the, deform with the correction of femur. Yeah, that, that is a great common mark. And you know what? It makes it even worse when you're trying to compensate with a bony correction, let's say when you have a posterolateral laxity in a child with blounts, because you've got ligamentous laxity to start with. Then you take a femur and you turn it into more valgus and you're compounding the shear forces at the knee joint. So, yeah. Okay. We may be... Uh, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, did you have um, your hand up? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you for the chance. Um, uh, we, in our uh, medial elevation study, we found a few children with uh, recurrent infantile blounts disease who ended up with uh, distal femoral valgus. Um, but I completely agree with you that they respond very well to guided growth. So we did, we, we did do that as well. So I think guided growth is very powerful. Um, so that was my one comment. And the other comment is not to forget about the rotational malalignment that some of these children will have. Uh, it has been shown, uh, Rollinson uh, showed that there's increased femoral antiversion in these children. And in a small subset of cases, this may be significant enough to require derotation osteotomy. Yeah, no, fair enough. I think, and I, we've all had some cases like that. And I know we're running out of time, but I do want to um, give a shout out to Mark Edelman for his work on sleeper plates. And I think that's a topic for another time. But uh, Mark, can you have the last word on that? What's uh, 
you know, especially in children with early onset blounds, there are some who would leave that metaphyseal, would leave, just take out the metaphyseal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, would, uh, yeah, take out the metaphyseal screw and leave the epiphyseal screw um, for ease of reinsertion. Um, do you have an uh, unbiased opinion on that for blounds? Uh, right now, I don't remember specifically on blound patient, but we stopped completely to uh, to leave metaphysial screw because we had uh, many complications uh, from this. And I, you know what, from time to time, I see uh, colleagues around the world they have the same experience. Now they were published a, a paper in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedia from Turkey with exactly the same results as uh, we published in GPO. So for me, leaving the slipper plate in place, it's a mistake. Okay. All right. Okay. And of course, you don't have strong opinions, so that's okay. Um, all right. Uh, James, any final words while we close? Uh, just one technical note. I saw your your lateral plate with a longer metaphysial screw, which I've been doing for years because I always found uh, the lateral screw, they were not sitting properly and they were not correcting. Did you find the same thing? Yeah, I think that's the one advantage compared to the staples that, you know, you can go pretty long for the metaphysial screw. And of course, you know, for the obese children, uh, we try to use a solid screw. Yes, I, I totally agree with you, not just for blounds, but in general for guided growth. Uh, it's it's good if if the space allows, you should go for a longer screw. Yeah. Yeah. And and I also rarely keep them parallel. I, I give a little divergence. Yeah. Anyway, I think we should possibly come to the end. I think uh, uh, I'm going to share the last three slides. I think they are there uh, for for all the delegates to for the certificate. Uh, I'll see whether I can share the screen. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, other sort of uh, webinars which are coming up, kindly, uh, kindly sort of go on to the CCOD website, CCOD Pioneer. And there is Fibler Hemimelia on November 23rd, as well as do not forget this uh, CCOD Congress, which uh, uh, Prof. Hosni is going to organize very soon. Anyway, a big thank you to all the panelists, uh, 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 as well as to my co-moderator Sanjeev and uh, Heman Sharma and Rajiv for giving us this opportunity uh, today. And thank you all for those who are listening to us. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.